So in this last part of the introduction, we're gonna give you a foreshadowing of what will be a major focus of the next portion of the course once we get done with the overview of the Java Streams framework in general. And this is going to be a quick synopsis of sequential versus parallel streams. Uh, again, the, the idea of this is not to be comprehensive, it's just to give you a taste of what we'll cover in a lot more detail later. So, by default, stream operations run sequentially. So if you just say stream, then you have a single thread of control, which of course will be mapped to, to one core. I guess over time it could be mapped to multiple cores, but at any given point in time it's only mapped to one core. And it'll be processing the behaviors that are specified on the source of data that it's pulling from. Okay, so far so good. If you change sequential stream to parallel stream, however, boom, all of a sudden, magically, you've got a whole bunch of threads running around. And we're gonna talk a lot more about these, these threads later uh, and the way that parallel streams works. Very quickly, what happens here is that a parallel stream takes its input and it splits it up into multiple chunks and then it uses this common fork join pool in order to process these chunks independently on the different processor cores. So that's what's really happening underneath the hood. Now, we will, of course, for completeness, cover how it works underneath the hood. Um, but for now, we can focus just on sort of the behaviors that occur because of the fact that things are running in parallel. So we'll, we'll also talk about how things work internally later, but that's not the focus right now. Parallel streams are often, though not always, much more efficient and scalable than a sequential stream. So for the same input with the same operations organized in the same way, in other words, everything looks identical except we just replace stream with parallel stream or parallel stream with stream, you'll typically get a big boost in speed by using parallel streams. If two things hold, number one, if you have a large number of elements to process, and number two, if each element runs for a fairly long period of time to process each element. So here's a very simple example. Uh, this is something that's for one of the programs we'll look at later, which is the these uh, search, search stream gang program. And in this case, we have the complete works of Shakespeare, and we do it, we do a search sequentially on the complete works of Shakespeare. This is somewhat like that program we looked at last week, uh, except it uses streams, not the more fundamental Java foundational functional programming features and object oriented features. And the sequential version of that takes about 2,000 milliseconds to run. But if we go up here and we run this thing in, in parallel with maximizing parallelism every which way we possibly can think of, we make things run much, much faster. And what's interesting about this is this particular set of tests were conducted on a quad core laptop. I now have a laptop with six cores, so I should rerun these experiments to see what the difference is. So it was a pretty, pretty powerful laptop, had 32 gigabytes of memory, and we saw a speed up, which you can see here, is actually more than the number of cores. So you can see that it's about a, five, a 5x speed up here versus the sequential version. How could you get that, right? How would that possibly work? Well, the reason that that behaved like that was because these are so-called hyper-threaded cores. And hyper-threaded cores use instruction-level parallelism to get even more processing taking place, even though you don't have physically separate cores, you have parallelism within a core. And so it actually gives this sort of super linear speed up. So that's pretty cool. It's pretty cool that without making a lot of drastic changes to the program, we're able to get you know, a linear, a, a better than linear speed up in the number of cores going from stream to parallel stream. Now, of course, not every program is embarrassingly parallel like that one, but it's, it's a good example, which you can often get if you, if you know something about how your data works. So one of the key things, and, and this will come back again and again as we talk about parallel streams especially, when you write a program that uses streams or parallel streams, but especially parallel streams, you have to be very careful to make sure that the output of a behavior in a stream depends only on the input arguments to it without any side effects. Side effects are the root of all evil in parallel computation, and some people would argue in computing in general, but certainly with parallelization, side effects have all kinds of 
um, undesirable outcomes. Uh, here's a simple example of something where we have a method, a behavior that only depends on its input and only produces one source of output. So we get a string in and we capitalize that string consistently and we return the capitalized string. And so I think you'll agree with me that there are no side effects here other than returning the output that's a transformation of the input. So that's good. That's, that's a good example of a behavior. Uh, there's other examples of behaviors that are not as well behaved as the one we see here. And the problems occur if you have behaviors with side effects. And this will get you into trouble because you'll end up with so-called race conditions when we run things in parallel streams. So race conditions, as you could discern if you read this link down here, are hazards that arise in software where an application depends on the sequence or the timing of the threads or more specifically the cores in order for it to operate properly. So if there's something that makes your program work only if you get lucky and the threads and the cores happen to run in a particular way, those are examples of things where you have race conditions. So you don't really know whether you're going to get lucky or not on any given run. And that's one of the key hazards. If you recall, there were three types of hazards. We had race conditions, we had deadlock, and we had these things called memory inconsistencies. And, and all those things can happen, but um, race conditions and, and memory inconsistencies can also occur if you're not careful. So let's take a quick look at an example. I think I went over this before, but I'll just reiterate it because it may make a bit more sense now that we started talking about streams. So here we have a factorial program that's going to compute n factorial. As you can see here, we make a new single instance of the total class, which we call total t. And this class contains a field, m total, which is long. And that field, there's only one instance of that field. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to have a multiplication method that will increment m total by, or it'll multiply m total by n. It looks innocent enough when you look at it. However, there's no synchronization on this state. So when we put this thing inside of a stream, as we're going to see here, and we generate a range of numbers from 1 to n, and we run these things in parallel, we will have multiple threads of control simultaneously calling malt and updating m total quote at the same time. And that is almost guaranteed to induce race conditions. Chaos and insanity will, will break out um, if, if you do this. And if you want to prove this to yourself, try running the EX16 example on your laptop, especially if you have a multi-core laptop, or I think we probably all have multi-core laptops now. Uh, and you should get very strange results for this particular uh, input. And that's because you got race conditions. Now, uh, there's other problems here as well. We have memory inconsistencies as well. But the long and the short of it is this code is buggy. And it's an example of us using parallel streams. So we, we're trying to be good. We're trying to use the features in Java. But we forgot the golden rule of parallel streams, which is don't have method references or lambda expressions with side effects. As you can see here, the call to malt has a side effect, which is to change this m total field that's shared in a way that will be inconsistent when multiple threads modify it simultaneously. Does anybody know why that doesn't work? Why, why, is this, um, why is this particular piece of code going to cause trouble? What's the reason for that? Yes. Right, exactly. So in a nutshell, uh, the explanation here is something called a write-write conflict. So you have two threads that are simultaneously trying to write to the same region of memory. And in modern hardware, especially modern multi-core hardware, the hardware is designed deliberately with something called a weak memory model, which sounds kind of strange, like, 
Why would you want it weak? It should be strong. Well, there's actually lots of benefits for doing weak memory models because it allows the hardware to cache the data more efficiently, which is good, except when you have things that are trying to write to the same region of memory. And in that case, you can end up with these, these collisions, which is why I always pick, show a picture like this. There's multiple threads trying to share the same physical space, and the data collides. And so you'll either end up with, you know, as, as was pointed out, sort of a jumble of the bits of the, the two results, or you'll end up overwriting one result with something else. So the long and the short of it is you'll end up with results that are mysteriously inconsistent, which is very, very frustrating, because it would be nice if it was always inconsistent, and always inconsistent in the same way. But instead, you get things that are mysteriously inconsistent. So it's, it's a little bit beyond the scope of this class to talk about um, the full range of ways to avoid this. For example, one simple way to avoid this would be to tag this, this method as a so-called synchronized method. And that would make the problem go away with respect to consistent output. But it would also then become a serialization bottleneck, and your program would run very slowly. So there's actually much, much better ways to do this. And the much better ways to do this is to avoid shared mutable state at all. And that's a, a better way to do it. And we'll talk about how to do that shortly. So the, the key thing to remember here is that only you can prevent concurrency hazards. And you have to be the one to avoid them. The compiler won't save you. The Java virtual machine will not save you. Only you can save yourself. And there's really three ways to save yourself. Um, maybe only two ways to save yourself. One way to do it is to partition the input space such that there, in fact, is no sharing of mutable data. That's the easiest way to do it, because then there's no sharing, so you can't have any, any uh, contention. You can't have any race conditions. And that's largely what the streams framework and the parallel streams framework allows us to do. The alternative way of doing it is to have sort of a, a synchronizer placed to guard access to the shared state. And that also works, but it usually ends up with bottlenecks, and so is therefore less desirable. OK, so that's a quick summary of sequential versus parallel streams. As I said before, We'll cover this topic. We'll cover the overall topic of synchronization much more thoroughly in the upcoming class next semester. In this class, we're going to focus on streams first and then parallel streams. Um, and you'll see how easy it is to go from one to the other, which is part of the benefit of that functional paradigm. The other thing that you'll see is that only minuscule changes are required to do this. And another thing you'll see is that learning to be a good streams programmer, sequential streams programmer, automatically makes you a better parallel streams programmer, if you follow the rules, uh, because the changes are so minuscule in the code to go from one to the other model.